All right, you guys, welcome. So we are off by a couple days here, but I cannot tell you how uh, how busy the last uh, couple of weeks have been. So I've got a new course out. I got the course out on the Baltimore Chop. I think there was enough confusion about how to handle uh, those opening gap trades that it just finally lit a fire under me. I did a massive course on it, it's like a four-hour course with just tons of drills and examples and things. So if you're watching this on the replay or if you're um, here because of the, the opening gap course, it's ready. I've had people asking me forever for you know something really in-depth. We had that little 20-minute course, that little half-hour course. Um, that didn't do that was not um, enough of a drill for most people. So this one, if that's what you've been looking for, there it is. It is ready to go. It'll be on the site um, probably tomorrow. Or if you've been talking to Victor about it, um, you know, he can get you connected on that ASAP. Um, and then, of course, I've been doing a bunch of stuff on the road. So we've had some great experience. I met some great people. And I can't tell you how much we enjoyed Dallas and um, how much we enjoyed last weekend in the South Bay here in Southern California. It's so rare that we get something in SoCal. Um, but the Metastock group was fantastic. And if you were at either of those things, then um, kudos. It was a great crowd. You guys asked great questions. And, um, you know, I'm happy that everybody seemed to get as much out of it as, as, uh, as they did. And we got some folks coming to boot camp um, just from uh, the, the Saturday session. I mean, they came down to make sure that this was something they wanted to do. And, and you know, we talked for a couple hours, and I think that, uh, you know, I think this is looking like it's going to be a better and better event in November. This is going to be a really good mix of uh, the alumni and some new folks who are not new to trading by and large. Um, there's mostly going to be people there who've been trading some stuff for a while, mostly like options and, uh, you know, coming in sort of light on the equity side. But by the time you leave, I promise you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to love it. And then we've got a, a fellow who's pretty new to trading equities who is uh, just bright as sunshine and asking, you know, all the right questions constantly, which is great. All right, so if you're going through that ITA stuff and you're confused about anything, do not stay confused. Call, uh, Call and let Victor know you want to talk to us or call us directly and just make sure that, um, you know, whatever whatever it is that you're having trouble with, uh, that we get it cleared up just immediately, right? That's our, our goal is to make sure that everybody who's coming to this thing is, is going to be up and running um, and ready to go. So those of you who just signed up, you'll be getting your uh, Income Training Academy stuff this week. And... Um, you know, I'm just going to say start drilling down this weekend and work through it. And then, you know, let's talk early in the week and make sure that uh, um, you know where you are and that uh, if you have questions, we get them answered so that you can keep moving through the material and, and get it all under your belt. Okay, so we do have some questions from people regarding um, the XRV setups and how they work. So the first thing to remember is XRV is different than the Around the Horn plan. And you are going to have stops that are going to be wider uh, than the stops on ATH. And that happens to be one of the questions. Um, so let me just get a screen shared here. And... There we go. So I'm just going to go through these questions um, sort of one by one, and we're going to try to knock these out in the hour. I think you guys are all going to find this stuff informative. Um, so the first question, the idea for stop seems to be a natural support rather than how much money you, you're willing to lose. That's correct. Sometimes stops or natural support can be very wide. Do you really not take into account how much you could lose in setting the stop? Do you reduce the share size? So the answer is yes. You're going to re you're going to reduce share size. So let's look back to last week. Um, there was a bunch of questions that came in around last Wednesday setups. Of course, we had a really um, strong day that day. The market uh, took off to the downside. Of course, we were 
correctly placed for a market correction. We were not in today at all, as you saw, right? Today was a day that we pulled the plug on everything, Julie and I, um, in reviewing the setups um, that we had on deck. There was a sign in everything that I looked at that said today was likely going to be either a consolidation day or an outright uh, small reversal day and that we were going to wind up getting stopped out of a bunch of stuff. When I see that, right, I pass it along to you. I'm not, I am not looking to get you in front of trades every single day. So there is going to be times that, you know, when we see something happen, um, like what happened Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of last week, and then I start looking at the futures going into another, you know, another week, and I see indications like we saw, you know, the, the opening indication for today, that's when you're going to get those emails saying there's not going to be any setups. Let's just sit on our hands for a day. But now let's look back at Wednesday's trades. So we actually have to go back to Tuesday to get a good feel for this. So when you get a stock that's moving like this down into the close, right? So you get your list of your XRV setups. And you're thinking about what you learned in the Income Trading Academy, hopefully, if you're coming to the boot camp. And, um, you know, if you're not, if that's, if that's not where you are yet or if you're just new to this, the idea really is to take a look at what happens over the course of a session and to figure out where the most likely place is that you should be putting a stop loss, where the natural resting place is just for the opening bell. And the reason I'm saying it is just for the opening bell is because your natural inclination is going to be you want to set a stop real tight, right? So if you've got, in this case, um, you know, an entry below $96.97 and you have a dollar target on this thing or something, what you really want is a, is a stop that's pretty tight. So you don't want to have a, a stop that's intuition, right? Intuition is telling you you want to have a stop that gives you a reward to risk ratio that's better than one to one. That's, that's an accepted. However, before the bell even rings, right, on the NASDAQ stocks, and then this goes to uh, your question, Dennis, about NASDAQ versus NYSE, and this is Eric's question regarding, you know, where I'm placing stops. NASDAQ has a lot more price elasticity, especially around an open, right? So if, if you remember your, your economics 101 and the notion of price elasticity, price elasticity happens in the markets just the way that it does in econ. And the NASDAQ has not got as tight a parameter around everything as NYSE does. NYSE, one market maker, he's called a designated market maker. We used to call him the specialist, right? I know half those guys. They do their trading within very defined bands. So when you look at NYSE stocks, when you look at the around the horn trading plan, right, the core trading plan, that's all NYSE listed stuff. And all those NYSE listed stocks, they have real firm support and resistance. Go through and look at the trading plan historical data and, and say to yourself, I want to see how many times Adrian got the profit target exactly right. Do it going back, do it going forward. And, you know, part of me wants you to say, oh, my God, this guy's like an oracle. Look at this. He picks these profit objectives. Boom, 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 boom. It just hits that profit target. And every time when it hits his target, it reverses. That's the end of it. He got the move exactly where it was going. He must know something I don't know. I don't know something you don't know. What I know is how to interpret order flow. And what I see is where support and resistance is. And on an NYSE listed stock, Support and resistance levels tend to be absolutes because one person is doing the majority of the order handling on that stock. And you can get a feel for the difference between, you know, the Barclays specialist who's handling Michael Kors and he's handling, uh, you know, let's say Harley Davidson or, you know, you see these names pop up on my trading plans frequently. 
That's because I know those guys. I know how they handle. You know, I know exactly how Jason handles cores, and I know exactly how Jason handles hog, and I know, you know, the the variety of humans down there who are in these booths. They all handle one stock. And it gets to be the case that you know the personality of the stock, you know the personality of the person trading it. So that's why on NYSC stocks, right, you can start on a NYSE list of security. And every day on that trading, um, on that, uh, uh, hang on one second. On the XRV plan, I give you, off to the right, I list what the exchange is. So when you see NYS come up as the exchange, then typically what you can do is you can already start out with a tighter stop. If I see a NASDAQ stock, right, because it's going to, if the, on the NYSC, right, chances are if we hit this inflection and we break through, we're going to run higher. We're going at least up to here. And if we break 91, we're going to go at least up to here. And if you want to be very um, boot camp about this, right, and, and rely on what you've learned in your, uh, in your income trading academy so far, then you would go and you would take this big major move and you're going to look at, all right, where are the Fib retracements? Okay, there's a confluence area, 382 confluence that's right around that uh, second support and resistance. And then where is the volume weighted average price for this major move going down into the close? Okay, it's up in here. And where is the volume weighted average price for the last move that travels down into the close? Look there. So on the NYSE, if I move up through 97.67, I've also moved through 97.60, which is the VWAP of this move. Right, you learned all of this. All this stuff is so start trying to get it to gel, right? Start looking at that. And we're going to do a ton of this at boot camp. But, you know, I want you to come in just having these ideas in mind. I mean, you, you've been through, you know, 20-something hours of, of online training before you ever get there. And this is one of the things you're focusing on is sort of where to find these pockets of volume weighted average price that are going to be important. In this case, this is it, right? Big move going into the close. This tells you if you get up through here, through this stop loss, then the next place you're going to have to get is up above this support and resistance and probably into here. Right here represents the biggest stop that you're probably going to have to take on a NYSE for the following session. You know, now on this day that everybody was asking about, we didn't have any NASDAQs. So as you went through and you were setting these stops, you were able, right, over the course to, and now I don't know, you know exactly where these landed in the morning, what they tested, but you can see I'm just going through and I'm finding where the inflections are and where am I expecting then. And you're going to be able to do these just this fast after November, I promise, right? So once you've been to boot camp, you're going to be going through and you're going to be looking at these moves and this is how much time it's going to take you to set these up. That's my, those are my stops, okay? Now let's look at the next day and see how these play out. Okay, so now you're in on the open. Stock comes crashing down, right? Immediately hits your profit objective. This is a no-brainer. But what would you have done if the stock opened and it fluttered around? Let's say it did this, right? Pretend this is the open and that this is the move that we're looking at. Okay? It opened. It tracked higher. And then it started tracking lower. What I would do is right away, I would start focusing on where can I move my stop? How can I tighten my stop up? So that wide stop that you're using on those XRVs right after the opening bell, that's just your stop after the opening bell. You're looking for an inflection that tells you that if it goes higher than this, 
right, I'm likely going to see price move up and out of the range. So I'm always trying to pull these down. So if you have a big stop, let's say you have, sometimes these stops are $1.50, $1.50, $1.60 on the open. That's just so that I'm going to let this thing move around after the opening bell. Okay. And, it, you know, if it pops up into here or it, or it swings around, I just want to make sure I don't get taken out on a straight tick. There's a lot of straight ticks, especially on the NASDAQ stuff. And immediately, I'm looking for the opportunity on these XRVs to go and drag in behind there. All right, every one of these. So look at this one. So here was where the stop was originally, $50.86. You had an entry down at $50.28. Again, it's a nice, so the, the parameter isn't quite as wide on it. But look, after the opening bell, I'm starting to look here. So I see these highs right in here. And then I look back and I see, well, if I go just up a little bit above those highs, that'll get me back up into this range. You don't want to be right here, right? That's a target. That's not a stop. If I'm looking at this, you think about what you learned in the Income Trading Academy. You're... Your targets are based on those hard inflections where you think something's going to bounce. Well, when you place a stop, you don't want to be where you think something's going to bounce. You want to be where if it didn't bounce and it moves through, then I don't want to be part of what's about to happen, right? So once I see this form and I've got resistance here and I see you know, that I've got volume building out by price, then what it tells me is, okay, I've got, I've got a pretty serious inflection point here that, you know, if it, if it fails, it's going to ricochet higher on me, and that's going to be a good stop loss. And if you go through these and you look at it, you're going to see that every day, right, here's one that didn't hit our target right out of the gate. And right away, though, we were able to go and pull down and say, here was the inflection. We see why that inflection happened. Here was support and resistance. If we track up a little bit higher, right, it gets us to the point that, you know, we can ratchet down on the stop. So you can get it down into here, you can get just up into here, but one way or another, that stop is going to start tightening up as soon as we see price activity first thing in the morning. Okay, so for all of these, it's the same story. You're going to, you're just looking at what happens, you know, except for this one, because it never tracked into the range. Um... You know, uh, Lion's Old Basil, probably leave that stop where it was. XYL, once it opens, starts trading, and we're probably going to move our stop down out of there. But So that stop, um, you know, for those of you who are questioning why it's so wide on a lot of these, is you've got to just give it room on the open to, uh, uh, you know, to move around. So what am I looking for is the next question when I want to move the stop to break even or above the previous day's closing range. Um, so pretty much just what I'm saying here is that this is the kind of thing that you want to see, that you have some sort of a test in your new daily range of the prior session's daily range that can get you tighter, right? Let's say you had a stop initially way up here somewhere that can get you tighter. You, you know, again, your gut says you want to be here. Reality says you probably got to be here. And once you get down 50% of the distance to the target, then, you know, on the, on the around the horn trades, those definitely go straight to, you know, break even. On break even being the prior sessions extreme, right? Not the, not the entry tick. But on the um, XRVs, you know, my scratch stop for this would be about there, $50.35. It would not be fifty twenty eight. It would be just up into where we saw something happen. Um, how do you find a stop when there's a fast, steep line into the close rather than above or below a consolidation? Volume weighted average price, yes. So the VWAP of that move is typically then where I go and find a stop or I look out at this um, this data over here, 
okay? And when we get, so say you have this giant move coming down into here, then what you're going to want to do is look for volume plateaus by price. So you know, here's a plateau, and here are some plateaus. And you can see that, you know, let's say that we were getting short down here somewhere. This aggregated price data over here, which is a little skewed, right, because we got the whole day in here by the time we're looking at it, but this aggregated price data over here is telling you that a move back up above this is likely going to see a move back up into the range. And then you've got the pivot line that's going to be inflection, and you've got this prior that's going to be an inflection, but this is going to give you by volume and Right. Our suspicion is that there is your VWAP. So a couple pennies higher is probably the safer stop because you're taking into account the volume weighted average price. But realistically, you know, by the time you see a little support and resistance, well, you didn't know that this was here right on the way down. So this volume weighted average price would have been a good place to tell it you know, as you're going from here down to this low. That's your, uh, that's your VWAP then. And, and you always want to look for things that are confluent. You always want to look for things that are overlapping when you're looking for these. Um, sometimes the closing range is unclear or all over the place, and I don't see an obvious support or resistance. Not really sure of the logic there either. Um, you know, in that case, look to volume. Look to go and... Um, you know, a good habit that you can get into is you can take the um, uh, time of sales data for the session that you're looking at, and then you know you look at whatever time period of the day that it is that you're interested in, and if you go through, then you know again there's a very quick exercise that you're doing. You're just going to go in and look to see, you know, for whatever period of the day that you're looking at, if you found volume out here and you found volume down here, then, you know, you can go back through your time of sales data and look to see how persistent the bid and ask are. So that might be more than, you know, you really want to drill into this kind of stuff, or you can, you know, you can even write, we've got guys who write little uh, uh, VBA scripts that, you know, in Excel, we'll go through and parse this kind of stuff out and tell you, you know, how persistent the bid was, how persistent the ask was. We'll talk about that at boot camp, too. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got one of our, our uh, Excel wizards come into that, and, um, you know, those, those are just nice little tools to have. But the reality is, you know, that you should be able to just look through the tape and see what's happening at any given time of the day and see, you know, what the, the bid and ask are and what the prints are that are going off. But realistically, if you're just looking at the tape, you ought to see even a big persistent downtrend like this, right? Here's a very significant level. Here's a significant level. This little um, uh, distribution here is significant, and this distribution here is significant. So those are the, the kinds of things that you should be wrapping your head around. Um, in your videos, you talk about NYSE listed stocks being treated differently than NASDAQ. Can you go through the details about how that affects entries, stop, and limit settings? So when I'm dealing with a NYSE stock, an NYSE, New York Stock Exchange listed security, then I'll set my order up, generally speaking, a little bit wider when it comes to the limit because... <laughs> The, the way the ladder works, right, the way that the montage works is your order has to get elected. It tends to be the case that if you're willing to accept a bigger slip on the, on the big board, right, on the NYSC, you will actually receive the smaller slip. So by saying to, um, you know, by saying to the order desk, look, I'm willing to get in from, uh, uh, look, I'm looking to short this. I want to get in from uh, $49 is my, is my stop price. And I'm willing to take a slip down to 48.70, and somebody else puts in $49 down to 48.90, and then magically, right? I get filled 
at 48.95. The guy at 48.90 never got filled at all. It was because I was willing. I had the more marketable order, right? Those, those. If a limit order with a widespread to a specialist says, "Okay, I've got a marketable limit order," and a limit order with a very narrow spread says, "You know, I've got this window order that, you know, I've got to, I've got to figure out if I can match." They're, they're going to elect the, the more marketable of the orders. On the Nasdaq, on these XRVs, especially. Right. I mean, this is really where we're trading on the NASDAQ. So the, the NASDAQ trades that we do on the scalper plan, those are super caps. You should be setting your slip to about a penny. There is no slip on those. Those things are trading 15, 20 million shares a day. You don't need to adjust for any slippage whatsoever. You can just say, this is the price I want to get in at, and it's going to hammer around that price, and it's going to get you in. The XRVs, these trend to, tend to be, you know, 400, 500, 700,000 shares a day, sometimes, you know, a million, two million, three at the high end. Um, these, what I'll do is I'll say, you know, for my limit on these, whereas on the NYSE, I'm looking for a 10 cent confirmation of the violation of the low, right? So if I wanted to get in to ALSN, which is an NYSE stock, and 48.95, is the low of the prior session, then I'm automatically looking at 48.85 as the price that I'm going to trigger, and then I'm looking at 48, probably 75, as the worst allowable slip. Whereas on the NASDAQ, what I'm saying is, as long as it's trading above 48.85, then I want to get short anywhere between 48.95 and 48.75. So what I'm giving this is more just sort of wiggle room right around the open because these NASDAQ stocks tend to hammer around the open. So if I'm setting this up as, a, um, as an order, okay, And let's just call this a NASDAQ right now, um, even though it's a NYSE. Let's just pretend here. If I'm setting this up, and remember, never trade more shares than you are comfortable trading. So, you know, what I trade has nothing to do with what you should be trading. If, if you're new to this stuff, always consider the magnitude of that stop loss before you put an order. And you might only want to trade 100 shares. I've been trading these a long time. I've got a good feel for them. I know what I can expect from these. So for me, I, I can take a larger a larger order. If you're brand new to this, trade 50 shares, trade 100 shares, simulate. You know, simulation is I'm going to say the um, is a godsend just because it lets people work with these things and get used to how they how they move. But so let's say I'm going to do this order. So I would do this as a conditional, and in this case, I'd use a, a price trigger, and I would say last price has to be greater than. 48.85, and if it is, then I'm going to use a stop limit order, and my stop price is going to be, uh, we'll do 48.95, and I'll take a fill down to 48.75, and here's what you can expect. Generally speaking, you're going to get filled right around 48.85 on these trades. That's just how it works out. So you're going to wind up getting filled the same place you would on the NYSE trade, it's just you have to structure the order a little bit differently because the NASDAQ stocks tend to swing right into that open. They tend to have a, a move into the open. Um, let me see if this is the rest of this question. So, yeah, the, the general rule is you're going to handle them a little bit differently, and that's why they're identified on that XRV setup as NYSE or NASDAQ. You just have to sort of get a feel for which one's going to have more volatility around the open, which one can have a harder stop, you know, a, a tighter stop. And as I said, once you're in, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're able to ratchet down and protect your, uh, protect your position as quickly as you can. The next question is about 
the simulator. So now mind you, I have I really have no relationship with these guys outside of the fact that I like the simulator and I, I use it myself. Um, but a nice way to handle things with this is right, so now you go back to the 10th. And for those of you who aren't trading these live yet, you can go in and, you know, let's say ALSN. So you want to know how I would set these things up. So you can see here I've got the symbol ALSN. And then you want to set this thing up to, you know, roughly the size that you're going to be trading. And, you know, in the simulator, you can set a thousand, you can do whatever, actually. I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? It's, it's, you're trying to, you're trying to get a feel for how these things play out. And now you're looking at, you've got your prior day here. And you come in and you can select your horizontal line tool. And then you just come down and you say, here's going to be my entry. And where am I going to put my stop? So come in and let's say that initially, this is a good way to test your stop logic on these things. You know, you can go back, you can go back two years on this. I mean, you can go back through all the XRVs you want to go through. And now you've got, let's say you've just got this set up as your, the magnitude of your order. Then you come in here, you can select your order type. Um, you know, you can set your account settings here somewhere. Hold on a minute. Settings. Right, and you can do your money management and you know the account balance, right? So I started this one with fifty thousand dollars, I guess. Put your trading fees in, right? So if you're coming to boot camp and you're opening an account with um, with Vision, right? Whatever you do, do not call Vision directly and say I want to open an account because they are not going to give you that price. You have to go through the introducing broker um, and just call me and I'll give you his phone number. They'll set you up then with the lower commission rate and with the rebate for the cost of going to the boot camp. But once you have all these things in place, all right, now you say, I know what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to get a, let's say, a $50 and 27 cent entry on this. So we're going to do a stop limit order. All right, very simple. If it trades at Fifty dollars and twenty-eight cents. So now this is set up different than real tick, right? So it's instead of a stop price, it's called an activation price. I think that's because a lot of people get the stop and the stop loss confused. The stop price is just where something happens, right? It's just an activation price. So stop loss is a stop that controls the loss. A stop limit order has a stop that controls where the limit is going to be active, and the limit in this case is the price. And we're going to say $50.18. And this was a short sale, so we tell it to sell it short. All right, now everything's done here. Um, you can decide if you want this pane over here open. I, I tend to not like that thing very much. Um, and then you, know, you want to make sure it's a day order. And then you want to make sure that you know where your um, stop losses, so you can enter that. So you have to enter these as three legs. Okay, that's another thing that's not the same as real trading software. So you're gonna, you have to, uh, you have to allow things to develop a little bit and then pause it. And then what I do is, I go bump it up to like three times, just so that we can get through these quicker. Um, when Julie and I are, are going back and trying to, you know, tweak Apple for our daily scalps or whatever, um, we do three to five times. I don't recommend doing anything faster than that because what you'll find is you're going to become just immensely profitable when you have these things set at really high paces. And that sounds counterintuitive, but what happens is it takes the boredom out of trading, and a lot of trading is about boredom, right? It's about sitting there and just you know watching the paint dry. And when you make it uh, occur at a faster pace, then what happens is all of a sudden you find yourself you know making these decisions. In a, in a way that di that's very different from how you would make them during the day. And then, you know, that changes things around too much. So I just recommend three times, at most five times. But not for the time where you're going to place the order. So when you're placing the order and you're getting ready to go, then you just want to hit it at three times maybe and then start it off. So now the next day starts. 
And you are watching this as it starts, you know, ticking into the session. I mean, even at three times, we're, we're not open yet on this. That's the other thing, right? So NYSE versus NAS. NYSE, just because it's 9.30 Eastern time, does not mean your stock is open for trading. It just means your stock's going to open relatively soon, or it's going to be announced as a halt. But typically, 9.30, 931, 32, that's when that's when the stock is going to open up, when the guy's got a liquid market that he can make. Now you're looking at this, and you see this high, and you see the price is moving back up into the range. So now we just want to watch and see, you know, how many times does it bounce up here and try to clip that high? Now what we already know is we're going to put a limit order in a dollar down, right? So we had to... Let me make sure this was one of the ones that didn't have a pivot. So we know where the pivot is. It's at uh, $49.50. And we know that the entry here was 50.28. So yeah, 49.50 is going to be our limit order. So a dollar or the pivot, whichever one is less, 49.50, we are looking to buy to cover. But we actually have to wait until it fills because you see what happens here on the simulator. So, you know, Mike, if you're watching, this is why it's not a buy to cover order because we're not short yet. So you're going to have to wait to place that other order until the stock actually goes and does, uh, does the trading at our price. Okay, now in the first bar, what I'm thinking here is I'm watching this and I'm watching where is it bumping, where is it finding resistance because we don't have volume by price data here, but we can estimate, right? We can watch. You can have a plot volume. You can put volume down here. But on the simulator, I just like to watch pure price data. And as of right now, right, I'm going to see if that original stop can't be moved down to $50.57. So prior to being triggered in, I'm going to watch this price action. I'm going to watch to see what inflections does it make. If it gets up above this high, I'm going to pull this thing back up into here. But right now, it's looking like this is the place that I want to put a stop. So, Eric, when you're watching these, right, the, the stop you had from yesterday's trading is just a stop to have in there. Just have it loaded up. Have the, the, you know, the orders get placed that way. And then once the stop is on the chart, you can just pull it around and you can move down and behind. So you want to select the price that's best based on yesterday's trading before today opens, but then once today opens, you want to see, especially if you don't get triggered in right away, you want to see is there a tighter place, a better place to put the stop that has more to do with what's happening uh, in today's trading and still makes sense against the backdrop of yesterday. Okay, now it looks like it's starting to track lower. Right again, even three times speed is, is slow on some of this stuff. Um, you know, and I'm getting more confident about that level right there. So then, you know, a little trick um, that you can do is, you know, once it starts into the travel range, you can hit five times. Now, it filled me, right? So I'm going to go and put my buy to cover order in at 49.50. And then I'm going to put my buy to cover stop market in up at $50. And let's do 60 cents. So now you've got two buy to cover orders, and then really at this point, you know, you can speed this thing up a bit. So you can see here that at five times, right, it becomes more palatable. At 60 times, right, it's terrific, but at this point, you've taken all the boredom out of it, and this is like, you know, instant gratification. You're, you're going to be able to watch this thing play out a little bit too quickly for the webinar. Let's just let it happen. Um, but then, yeah, Mike, when you're simulating, what you have to do is, is just keep an eye on it and let it, uh, you know, you're going to let it do its travel. You're going to let it hit the range, and then you're going to have to be ready to cancel the other leg of the order. So it's very much like the conditional orders in Realtek. If you use a conditional instead of a bracket, you're going to have to cancel the hanging leg, right? Or you're going to have to cancel that additional leg on it. All right, so now we're really flying. 
Boom. Okay, so you're out. Then you come back in and you cancel the rest of this order. So, you know, some of you are a little frustrated about things are moving beyond your, your target on these. Um, you know, is there a way to lock in more of the profitability? I, you know, on the XRVs, it's, if you go back and you look at them over the course of the year, you're going to find out a dollar or the pivot line is very typically going to be a really, really good target. And you can see here that it didn't extend much, right? It went down a little bit further, but it didn't, you didn't get much of an extension. And then you have this whole question of where do you take that extension, right? Where do you decide to pull the plug? And if you've known me for a while, then you know that maximum favorable excursion is not something I ever talk about in my, uh, in my trading plans or in my, in my trading period, right? What, what I tell you I'm going to do is what I do. That's my measure of success for me. Not that I get every penny that I possibly could get. Did I do what I planned to do? Plan the trade, trade the plan, and just get in and get out where I said I was going to have my decision points, move the target or move the stop, move the, uh, you know, your trailing stop down according to the rules of your plan. I get the 50% of the profit objective. I start ratcheting down to get closer to break even. On the around the horn trades, we get 10 cents to the target. You know, we ratchet into 50% on these trades. You know, if it if it's moving and it's heading down to a profit objective, then you know usually it it keeps going and it gets us right into that into that profit target. And then there was a question about, um, geez, you know, I missed I missed Wednesday and Thursday of last week, and now you know I feel like I missed the boat. How do you get your head back into the game? You don't worry about it. You, know, you missed it. You missed it. You missed it. That's all. That's all there is to it. There's going to be more days just like those. And if you're new to this, trust me when I say bottoms fall out of markets, and those are real good times to be trading. So for us, a correction or an all-out collapse, you know, is is a good thing. And I'm sorry if you're if you're a long-term investor and you hate to hear somebody talking like that. I'm sorry, but the reality is, as a trader. Markets fall faster than they rise, and when you get a, a, a correction or a crash, then you know it, it's a time to profit. It's a time to get in front of those opportunities to to really cash in. And look, you know, it's like I've got people asking me, you know, do you think the market's going to crash? Markets are crashing right now. We've had a bunch of mar markets crash. Look at look at the tech sector. It crashed. Doesn't matter, right? What what the news is saying about the broader market. The news is watching an index. The news is watching cap weighted indices to make a decision about whether or not to say, you know, in, you know, in their case, the sky is falling, right? It's it's always if the if the index goes and and moves below a certain point, then they're going to tell you that uh, um, that the market's crashing. But here's what you need to do, right? And this is why. You income trading academy guys, right? You should be getting used to flipping through charts on your own, not scanning for things, not listening to what the the news is saying about the indices. Look at this. So let's start. Let's just move through the A's, maybe. Okay. This this is the these are all NYSE listed stocks. Look at what's happening from January of last year to now in Agilent. You can tell me that's a bull market. How about Alcoa? Is that a bull market? AbV. Bull market or no? How about ABC? Right? ABT was good. Abbott was, you know, flying high for the last few months. Archer Daniel Midland was good. ADNT? Oh, not so good, huh? AEE was decent. Now we're on, we got four. Agnico Eagle. Down $16. AEP? flat since the beginning of the year. AER, back down where it was last January. AFLAC, back where it was last January. AH, AHL, back where it was. AIG, it's been traveling lower all year. Right? Albemarle, if you had $135 invested in that in the beginning of the year, you've got, you've got 96 left. Alaska Airlines, same story, 75 down to 60. Allstate, 105, 92 bucks. So, you know, some of you guys are reading too much into this notion of what the broader market is doing. The broader market has nothing to do with, with you or, for the most part, 
what people are invested in. Because Apple is going to skew the broader market. Right? They're always going to put stocks into the indices. Any cap-weighted index you're going to find when they reweight it is magically going to get rid of the Xeroxes and the GEs of the world and replace them with the high flyers of the day. Because they want that index to be you know, heading from the, uh, from the southwest corner of the chart to the northeast corner of the chart, and they should because that's their job. Your job is to go and pick these things apart and look at what is the broader market doing. Here you went from 102 bucks, $73, right? We're not even through the A's yet. And I'm going to guarantee you, if you do this exercise for the entire market, then what you're going to find out is if you had bought everything on the NYSC at the beginning of the year, you are not a happy guy right now. You are not a happy guy. If you traded it, then you know from trading it with us, things are looking pretty good. Right, and you just have to wrap your head around it. You know, I know Eric, you've you've been, you know, trying to get your finger on exactly where where it is that you're working here, what it is that that uh, you know you're doing in in shorting these stocks and buying these stocks, and and you know what what's the purpose in the whole thing? Well, the purpose is you know you're making a living and you're providing liquidity to the market. Market needs liquidity when it's moving up. Market needs liquidity when it's moving down. Do the short sellers push it lower? A little faster sure but I'll tell you what market bottoms out and they start covering they push it higher faster right so that's what this style of trading is all about you're getting in front of the opportunities every day to be part of what the institutional order flow is doing because those stocks the A's that we just went through are not move, moving lower because of retail investors I guarantee it it's because there's guys out there who are working for institutions the institutions are saying, liquidate these positions, we're out. Right? So now you're going and you're just trying to find where those pockets of liquidity are on the downside as well as on the upside. Right? We take plenty of trades that are heading higher doing the same thing, providing liquidity on the way up, and we're getting in on the tails of the institutions. All right, now let me see what we have for questions here. Okay, so the video will be posted tonight, yes. The audio might be a problem because we are having horrible, horrible Santa Ana winds here. So, um, you know, we've got like 90 mile an hour winds here at the beach in, uh, in Pacific Palisades. So hopefully the audio will be better when, uh, when you get the replay. Uh, yeah. Okay, XYL gap down immediately. Would you still have an entry set or would you have waited for a pullback first? So what you're going to do if it gaps down, listen, if it moves outside of, of your allowance, right, of you've got an entry price and you've got a maximum slip, if it doesn't hit your activation price and it goes beyond the maximum slip, then I wait for it to pull back. I wait for it to come back up into the range. It's got to go and hit that um, you know, that greater than or equal to value, it's got to hit that level, it's got to be greater than or equal to that number, and then when it reverses back down again, that would that would pick it up for me. Um, so, Greg, you know, it, it's, um, you know, think back, think back again to boot camp, right? So Greg's been to boot camp, um, you know, he's got, he's got a leg up on, on uh, some of you here, so he's done a bunch of this stuff plenty of times, and Reese too, and, and Mike. Mike, did I answer what you were going to ask me about the the simulator, or do you need something else? Just type it in there if you do. Um, so if yeah, if it was a if it was a Nasdaq versus if it was a Nisey. So the the thing that I'm looking at on the Nisies are the stops. So what what you're going to be tighter on on the NYSE order is that initial stop loss, right? So on the NASDAQ, we're giving it more room to swing, but just think about the way that the, um, that the around the horn trades and the stocks to watch, right, that portion of that trading plan go. 
those are all noisy. And when, when they hit a stop, what do they do? They blow through it, right? So if you hit the stop on one of the, the core trading plan trades, the around the horn trades, not the XRVs, on those around the horn trades, if it hits your stop loss, you really don't want to be in that stock anymore, right? You don't want to give it a wiggle room. You don't want to because those stops hit and then they rip. That's, that's the difference. Whereas on the NASDAQ stuff, you know, you tend to get enough play around those levels that you really need to give it room to wiggle. So you'll see that you're setting up your um, your trades for tomorrow on the XRVs, and then you see, well, there's a you know there's a stop down here, and then there's another stop about a nickel higher, and then there's a potential stop ten cents higher, and there's a potential stop twenty cents higher. It's just always better to give it that wiggle room, you know, all the way up to that last place that you see um, a stop, and then make the adjustment in the morning when you see where it actually inflects. A lot of people are sort of freaking out when they watch me set these stops, right? When I when I was doing the live trading and uh, you know I won that trading challenge, right? I mean, there's there's another example, right? You got 500 people watching you do this stuff, and I swear to God, there wasn't a sound in the room when I was setting that stop. Everybody was looking at me like I was crazy. I just kept saying, "Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna win this trading championship today for one reason. I'm actually trading this thing, right? I'm watching what it's doing. You got to watch what it's doing. If, if you're gonna trade, you, you got to be a trader. You got to be good at what you're doing." You just got to look at it and see it and feel it and start trying to interpret what it's telling you to do. And on the XRVs, on the NASDAQ stuff, I like to give it a little bit of room based on the prior session's trading. And then when the current session opens, right away I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, where do I want to move things, to tighten things up, to make the risk more acceptable, and to make the risk more logical, really. Right, because that's what it's really all about: is making it a logical place to put a profit objective and a logical place to put a stop loss. Because you know, you, you hit it right on the head here, uh, Eric. Market does not care how much you're willing to lose. I have said that for years. Market could care less how much Eric wants to make or how much he's willing to lose. Market cares about one thing and one thing only: price action, support, and resistance. Right? Where is the price action in terms of its relationship to support and resistance, and that is going to be where you set that stop loss. Um, would I recommend a trailing stop, setting the trades up the night before with conditional orders? It would depend on your platform. What you could do is um, you could set threshold exits, um, we'd have to take a look at what your software allows. So some software will allow you to automate things up. So what you can do is you can tell, so for instance, if you're using TradeStation, excuse me, a little bit more robust in terms of, of things that you can program versus Realtek. Realtek assumes, you know, you're sitting there working the orders. TradeStation will let you program things a little bit. So what you could do is say, if our stock opens, at, you know, let's say it's $50 per share is our, uh, our entry price. And then you get triggered into a position. Then set the stop at the high of the first five-minute bar and trail accordingly, right? So you could, you could set up a couple trailing stops based on, all right, I want my first stop to be above the high of the open. And then once I make it, you know, if, if last price is uh, less than or equal to for a short, of 50% of the distance to that profit target, you put that number in as a hard number, then trail stop, right? And you can put it like right around the entry price. So there's a bunch of stuff you can do. I don't know, um, you know, where you're trading or who, who your trading account is with, but there's there's a bunch of ways to do things. A lot of brokers have, um, you know, the ability to interface with Excel. Um, so you can, you can change your orders that way, or right? you can have thresholds set in, an Excel spreadsheet, and then it's just constantly comparing to see if the last price is a certain level, then use this next price as a stop loss, then use this next price as a stop loss. But, you know, without actually knowing where you're um, doing the trades, you know, some brokerage software is just going to be downright um, unfriendly to, you know, doing any kind of automation, and other stuff has just a really robust automation environment. And really, you just need to, uh, you know, you can just call your, your broker or your software provider and say, here's what I'm looking to do. 
I've got an order and you know I want to place this order on the open and around the opening bell I want to have a stop that allows for a little bit of volatility but once we get into the trading day I want that stop to automatically move to a next to another level you know is that possible in the platform and you know if so how do I do it and they should be able to walk you through it and if they can't walk you through it right away or if they say they they need to look into it just tell me you want to talk to somebody else you know because a lot of those guys are really just sales guys and what you want is somebody who knows how to use the software all right well yeah I mean if you reopen your trade station account you know and that's that's really um, you know they've got a bunch of options over there now where it's it's essentially free so well nothing's free right I mean you're gonna you're gonna be paying their market maker you're gonna be you know you're paying somewhere you're always paying somewhere especially in this business but one way or another it's it's doable you can definitely do it so that is I hope I hope I hope I covered everybody's questions if I overlooked somebody and you know when we get done here your question didn't get answered pick up that phone and call me you've got my number it's right up there 310-804-2248 anybody who is subscribed to anything that I do um, you know you, you can ask the guys who have been around for a while I am here to support you and answer questions and see to it that you get profitable all right, so I guess that's a hey, good group today. Thank you for sending in the questions. All right, that really, you know, some of you hate to send me questions because you don't want to suck up my time, and I get it, but I really appreciate having something to talk about, and it's nice to be able to uh, clear things up for people and, and get everybody on the same page. All right, folks, I will, uh, I will get this recording processed, and then we'll get it up there later. Sorry you had an audio problem, Larry, but uh, you, can, you can watch it later. I think other folks said the sound was pretty good. Hey, Bibbs. Hope, hope you got out of your, your, uh, your overnight okay. We'll have to talk about that. I'm going to slap you on the wrist a little bit, but uh, I have my fingers crossed that, that you were able to get out of there with, uh, you know, with some, some money in your pocket, hopefully. So. All right, guys, I will, uh, I will see you in the first hour trading pit tomorrow, and then this weekend we'll get back to the Saturday webinars. Have a great night, everybody.